I'd like to introduce uh, our friend Amos Gaines. Amos is uh, almost anyone that has a Moog synthesizer knows Amos. Uh, he's he's uh, just the guru over there that keeps all of our machines running and just sounding amazing. And I remember when I sent my Voyager back to you after banging it around on the road for a year that when I got it back, I swore that it sounded even better than when it was new. So um, anyway, I'm, I know I'm adding to Amos's workload just by saying things like this. But Amos is going to talk to us uh, a little bit about the modern generation of modular synthesis. And the current Moog Music Company uh, makes products that are indeed modular synthesizer products. Um, we've heard um, uh, we heard Tara and, and Dorit uh, use some Moger Fogers um, with various instruments. Um, the stations over there uh, have uh, the instruments all connected together. Um, and any of those instruments can easily interface with a, an antediluvian uh, piece of equipment like this from 43 years earlier. So over to you, Amos. Thank you very much. Check, check. Hey, OK. So, uh, yeah, as, as uh, Eric was saying, um, Moog, Moog isn't literally still making modular synthesizer modules in the sense that there is a, a new and vibrant generation of modular synthesizer module makers out there right now. If any of you are unaware of this, some of you may well know, you may even have modules by Dopefer and Harvestman and uh, a number of the other uh, make noise. Actually, uh, the, the head engineer of make noise is here somewhere. Um, Tony Rolando is his name, he's a wonderful individual. Uh, I digress a little bit, but my point is this right now is actually the best time in human history to be into analog modular synthesis. There, there has never been uh, more out there, more new ideas using these uh, fundamental principles of voltage control, freely patchable interconnection, and, and the ability of any process really to interact with and modulate any other process. And, and you know, to the extent that that modular philosophy that was burst by uh, Bob Moog and Herb Deutsch and the other pioneers and led to devices like this, those same ideas are now alive in every medium, you know, including software like Reactor for, uh, you know, for your large uh, computer systems, and there are modular synthesizer digital tools for iPhones. Uh, there's a great one called Jesudo that is, you know, it is literally the same mental process of patching together functions and processes however your mind dictates that they ought to be. If you think, oh, this is really great, but I would like it even more if, uh, you know, this LFO was modulating the amount of time that I was looping a piece of audio over here, all you have to do is think of it, and the tools exist now in the analog and in the digital domains to realize it. And so that method of workflow transcends volt per octave standards, it transcends analog hardware, it's just sort of a mode of manipulating sonic concepts, and you can, you can do that in any medium. And so that's what we are living in today. We, uh, you know, and so leaving the digital aside for the moment and getting uh, back to Moog, um, what, we, what we are making now is individual instruments and effects that all, um, most of the important functions and processes not only have knobs to control what they do, uh, you know, which you'll get on a, on a digital instrument. There are digital synths that are covered in hundreds of knobs and they all do really cool stuff when you turn them. But you don't, with those digital instruments, typically have an output or an input that lets you take that abstract process and feed it into the next thing, you know, across the room, some other interesting gadget that you want to tie into one cohesive whole. Um, and we support that now and in, in what we're doing still. Um, so I guess one of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, relative to this being a ubiquitous concept that uh, it's never been more alive than it is right now is that where I feel like Moog can do some of their best work now and going forward is in exactly the place where these wonderful new abstract digital processes that you have become real and become voltages and interact with the uh, the the analog oscillators and the, as August was saying, these continuous functions that happen in, you know, infinite resolution in, in time and in voltage. You know, you've got functions of voltage over time, you can represent them digitally by some number, uh, you know, and, uh, and some amount of time, but inherently you have a certain resolution below which you can't count 
anymore. There's a fundamental increment that you're counting in units of digitally, you know, and if you have a, you know, a, a million bit long number, uh, it's still at the very end, you have to increment it by some fixed quantum that you can identify. It's yay big, however big that is. And the beauty of analog, you know, an analog oscillator, an analog filter, is that uh, down to some sort of maybe conceptual hyperspace limit, uh, you know, but down to the granular level at which reality can be perceived, it is infinite, and you can keep subdividing and subdividing, and whatever your arbitrary process is, um, it's, it is as, as completely continuous as, as we can define. And so that's what you have with an analog oscillator, such as we still make, but now you have this wonderful ability to take that analog oscillator and these analog filters, and digital control has become good enough that you can come up with an arbitrary process like you might do in Reactor or like you might do in some fantastic computer program and output that as a voltage that's directly linked to the analog oscillator. And that gives you, you know, and filter and envelopes and so on. And that gives you the ability to make instruments such as we're making now. Uh, the little fatty, the Taurus, the Taurus 3, which is a new mode product from last year. Uh, I was very involved in writing the firmware for that. And so, so that's the perspective that I'm coming from, is that the, the other Moog engineers are much more talented in the analog domain, and they've created these beautiful oscillators and beautiful sounding filters, and then they give me these tools, and they give me this arbitrary processor, this embedded processor that runs code. And what that means is that I can use that processor to think of some behavior that I want to have happen. The user presses a button, what happens? It's completely arbitrary. It's, you can just magically define it in code and create a process like, let's say, an arpeggiator that plays a series of notes in time with, um, you know, in time with some clock, in time with your laptop, perhaps. You're playing Ableton Live, you hook it up via USB to this, this magical device here that has an arbitrary processor and continuous analog, warm-sounding tone generators. And just by, just by writing some code and just by defining any process that you can think of that's supported, you can then get that beautiful, pure tone in being controlled in ways that were, that were never possible in the 100% analog domain. In, a, in the 100% analog domain, if you want to make a sequencer, you have to have, let's say, 64 knobs and a bank of analog switches and all of this plumbing and hardware and all of this stuff costs money and how, you know, if you've ever actually tried to build a sequencer and thought, well, one knob's not that expensive and then you look at 64 of them and you're, you know, you're out a couple hundred bucks and all you've got is a pile of knobs, you don't even start to have a sequencer. You know, and these are the limitations that were uh, in place from the invention of these ideas up until very recently. And now, if a knob is six lines of code that exists somewhere, then they're basically free. You can have as many knobs as you have memory in which to hold the code that defines what a knob does. And the beauty of being able to hook that into a continuous, real analog process is that you don't sacrifice anything in sound quality. You've created a tone that resonates with people in an organic, natural way. It's beautiful sounding. So you're not sacrificing the stuff that we love about this wonderful world of sound generation. But you're taking all of the best strengths of the digital domain and you're marrying them to all of the best strengths of the analog domain and not really losing anything. In, in my view, and so that's what excites me. That's, that's my perspective, where I'm coming from as sort of one of the people that's helping to shape where we go from here, and you know, I listen to, to what uh, artists are doing with our equipment. I look at what artists are doing in the purely digital domain, and I think, how cool would that be if instead of some DSP oscillators doing this incredible fractal dance that's inspired by uh, you know, a video camera pointed at falling snow, there's, I mean, it's, if you can think of it, you can do it now. But um, I feel like my role is to preserve the, the continuity and the sonic experience that is, you know, it's so vital and fundamentally good that Bob and, and all of uh, you know, our friends and forebears have, have, uh, have given to us and look at all of the wonderful, incredibly uh, open and, and infinitely um, reconfigurable ideas that you now have in the digital domain. How do we take all of that good stuff and allow it to happen with this wonderful analog technology that there's, there's no reason to get rid of? It's like a classical, it's like a classical instrument. Uh, you know, the, the voltage-controlled oscillator and voltage-controlled filters, and they're, you know, they're a part of our sonic vocabulary now. And how do we keep that going into the future? I think we do that by embracing all of the wonderful and arbitrary ways that we can control 
those sounds in new ways and um, building new instruments that, that give, us, give us the best of both of those things. And so that's, uh, that's my goal at this point, and that's what I'm trying to do. And in the last several years, I started with Moog in 2004, I believe. Uh, Bob was still, still with us. I was very privileged to, to work with him directly for uh, a year or two before he uh, passed away, as we know. And um, in that time, um, I've been listening to, you know, a lot of the people in this room called me at uh, various times over the years with ideas, with questions, with complaints even, and, uh, and you know, and taking all of that in stride is, is how to learn what's happening now and what needs to happen next. And uh, so I hope uh, this little uh, rambling train of thought has given you some, some idea of what I'd like to have happen next. I'm very excited. As I said, this is the best time in history to be into modular synthesis and, and the definition of what modular synthesis is and can be is growing and redefining itself every day now in a way that it's just, it's a delight for me to see. And uh, so I encourage all of you, if, if, you're really, if you're already familiar with what I'm talking about, that's wonderful and we get to share in this, in this great thing and, and I'm very glad and, and, and I hope you share that. Uh, and if, if this is new and you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, but it's more interesting than not, uh, as I hope it was, um, then I encourage you to look out there, you know, look, you know, Google analog module, analog modular synthesis, and see the dozens of, of manufacturers that are out there now. There were maybe three or four back in the day. Beep! And uh, quite all right. Just uh, providing a little sonic example, modular synthesis. Boom. Anyway, um, so look out there and see what's going on nowadays because it's truly incredible. And, and even just to see what people have thought of, you know, new sequencers, new kinds of complex oscillators, three-dimensional wavetable scanning modules, you know, I, can, I, I could just, uh, you know, keep talking until I stop making any sense to anyone but the, the, uh, the extremely uh, modular obsessed. But the stuff that's out there is amazing. Look for it and, and, and you know, imagine what it can do. And then maybe, if you can, get a chance to listen and see for yourself because there's nothing more inspiring than direct personal experience. And uh, so I hope in some way I've been able to reflect some of that direct personal experience that I've had and communicate some of that inspiration and enthusiasm. I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Amos Gaines, Jack Skellington. Um, we're going to wrap it up here in just.